morning, everyone. Welcome to Seed State Slumber Party 2021. This is an initiative that was born last year based on the demand from international investors to have an opportunity to interact more closely with entrepreneurs, despite the vast time zone differences that are inherent with virtual events. It is great to see so many of you tune in from all over the world. We hope that you will hear interesting pitches and hopefully invest in some of the companies that will pitch today. My name is Alan Obilo, a management consultant with IntelliCup Advisory based in Nairobi, Kenya. I will be your host for this session. Suncup works with diverse entrepreneurs in testing and scaling innovative impactful solution that can tackle complex development challenges affecting the low income consumers. We aim to help innovators position themselves for future growth. Today we will meet six startups, seven startups who are tackling some of the world's most pressing challenges. We have seven minutes presentation from the enterprises followed by eight minutes Q and A session from investors in the room. Let me take you through a bit of housekeeping. <clears throat> Please keep yourself mute during the pitch session, except for the presenting enterprise. During the Q&A session, please use the raise hand feature in case you'd want to ask any question. Otherwise, feel free to put your question on the chat box and I'll be able to fill them to the entrepreneurs. If, uh, if any particular question is directed to someone, please write it down uh, as in an, an entrepreneur, then later on, you can always come back and respond to it. And, la and lastly, feel free to introduce yourself and meet the participant in the chat box. It's always good to know who else in the session. I welcome all of you to visit the enterprises in the virtual exhibition booth on the Brella platform. First, we will hear from Aurora, a clean energy company based in India. This female founded business builds truly scalable community using affordable renewable energy as a vehicle for innovation. Aurora's solar products are co-designed with communities to bring more opportunity to women and youth. Savita, please take it away. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, trying to share my screen. Is that visible? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Savita Sridharan, CEO and founder of Aurora Global. And I'm truly honored to be um, picked as one of the startups to be presenting at Sankalp, which is uh, such a uh, beautiful global community. I wanna start with the story of Lakshmi, who is uh, one of our beneficiaries, a 25 year old woman who lives in Trichy, Tamil Nadu, which was once known for agriculture and sustainability. But today because of climate change and global warming, the community is land is dry and the, the uh, land of Trichy has no agricultural income. Lakshmi cannot find any alternate well-paying jobs and constantly lives in a fear of crime, health hazard, and her children victim to poor quality education because of lack of access to electricity. Lakshmi is only one in 1.1 billion people around the world who still do not have access to electricity today and cannot generate an income because of lack of access to electricity. The problem basically exists because there is no single business model that touches these communities that are impacted by climate change brings alternate sources of energy, and at the same time provides salary for these uh, women and profit for the business, all of it while staying in the, their own community and adapting and not migrating to the cities. This is where we come in to bridge the gap. We are Aurora Global, a truly uh, a, a, a social enterprise built, that builds truly sustainable communities using affordable renewable energy as the vehicle for innovation. Our programs are co-designed to bring more opportunities to women and youth within their own community. Although our focus is SDG 7, which is uh, renewable energy, um, our model touches 14 
of the 17 sustainable goals. Our main product is the Aurora Power Hub, which is a 1.5 kilowatt to, five kilo, uh, to 10 kilowatt solution, which provides reliable power for 12 to 16 hours when installed on any community center and a backup power for four to six hours. It can operate in a solar mode or hybrid mode. In hybrid, it switches to electric, uh, from electricity to solar when the electricity is shut down. The cost of the solution is 11K USD with a profit margin of 30 to 40%. An example of uh, Aurora Power Hub is the garment manufacturing hub that you see here. Here, uh, 10 of the sewing machines, um, powered machines have been installed under one hub and has been completely solar powered. 20 women work at this hub and have been able to increase their productivity by 10 times and reduce the greenhouse, gra uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 15 times. This is one uh, such example. They used to work long hours till 4 a.m. the next morning, but now they are able to meet market demands because of reliable access to electricity. Another example of Aurora Power Hub is a girls' hostel where the girls were dropping out of school. Once we solar powered the girls' hostel, they st stayed on campus and this dropout has reduced to zero. At this point, we're looking at the Indian market, which has 63 million manufacturing SMMEs in India. Even if we took, uh, so uh, research shows that 46.5% of this population still use diesel generators. Even if we penetrated into 1% of this market, we're looking at a serviceable, obtainable market of 3.2 billion. Our revenue model is simple. We sell our Aurora Power Hubs to the community, that is the nonprofit organization or the manufacturing partner. If uh, the second revenue model that we have is for an investor to come in and invest in the infrastructure. And once the infrastructure is installed, we start the manufacturing cycle and uh, we profit share. That is every garment that is stitched or every product that is produced, part of the profit is divided between the partners. So we expect to break even within 12 months. Uh, our distribution model is simple. We uh, partner up with nonprofit organizations or manufacturing partners on the ground train electricians from their own community, co-design a solution, install the solar solution and service it for three years. For example, here in Trichy, um, we have partnered up with a nonprofit Sevai. Then we brought in uh, electricians from the local community and trained them on how to install and maintain solar power. This includes 30 women from the local community we were, which, who are from the agricultural background but have now learned electronics and can serve as any of our product and solar uh, and uh, make solar street lights. These women have also gone out and found orders for us uh, with order of 50 power hubs for us from the community, all of them in the garment manufacturing segment. Uh, so far we have installed 17 Aurora power hubs and um, created jobs for 300 uh, people with our products and services, 30 of which are electricians. Um, we have raised 350K in investment so far, and uh, the salary of each of these women, like Lakshmi, uh, has gone up from zero to uh, about $400 uh, a year. In the next um, five years, we are looking at installing 400 such uh, Aurora power hubs. Uh, in the next 18 months specifically, we are looking at installing 100 power hubs, out of which 75 of them are confirmed. Um, in next five years, we should have uh, 400 power hubs, which provide employment opportunity to 10,000 uh, people uh, in their, within their own community and reduce their emissions by 3,124 uh, 3, uh, 3, tons. For the next 18 months, we're looking at an in investment of 1 million to scale up our impact. Instead of uh, uh, buying products one by one, we want to mass order the products since we already have the orders confirmed and go ahead with the installation. Uh, we have a strong team which has made it possible to achieve this. I bring with me um, um, 12 years of experience in technology development and chip design and seven years in the clean energy space. I'm an ultra marathoner, uh, only mention that uh, because I'm pretty resilient uh, in, uh, in the work I do. Um, we have uh, uh, Sridharan who has 40 years of experience in product design and innovation and Sarala who has 20 years of experience in uh, running manufacturing centers uh, run by women. 
we have had help from a lot of people uh, who have mentored us, including president of Coca-Cola, Sangam Ventures, MIT D Lab, um, uh, Unis Social Business, Social Alpha, Tata Power, and more. Uh, we have had several uh, recognitions so far, uh, and we are still growing. There's a wonderful opportunity here of energy poverty, which can be converted into an entrepreneurial opportunity for women around the world. And I welcome the Sankalp community to join us in our journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savita, for that presentation. Very engaging and such a great work that you're doing out there. Thank you. Uh, from your presentation, you mentioned that you are currently having 17 solar hubs that are have been installed. So I just wanted to understand before I welcome any question from the participant or the investor in the room, out of the 17, would you say all of them are active and how many are they serving? How many people are they serving currently? Sure. So um, uh, most of, uh, in 2015, there, were, there was a huge flood in Chennai, India. And um, for a brief period, as we were pivoting, we got into uh, setting up homes, solar homes for people. So here's an example of what a solar home uh, looks like. So out of the 17 of them, um, uh, about 10 of them have been in these kind of homes uh, where we've installed solar and they're still functional. Uh, the remaining are uh, the girls hostel and um, other locations that we have installed, including the garment manufacturing unit. So they're all functional and we constantly check on them right now. Like every three months we check on them. Thank you. Any question from the audience? You can mute yourself and go ahead and so as we wait for questions from the audience. So, what are some of the challenges that you're facing while installing these hubs, which could be hindering your operation and just your activities? Sure. So um, one of the biggest challenge uh, uh, we are facing and uh, we are in the process of overcoming is uh, uh, with the COVID, it has been very difficult for, uh, uh, there's been a lot of businesses that have lost a lot of money and uh, 8K USD, uh, 11K USD is a lot of money for a lot of entrepreneurs uh, to buy the product from us. So uh, getting paying customers through COVID has been pretty difficult, but uh, we have been able to sustain ourselves with uh, a number of grants and we've been able to uh, give to the community with the grants and uh, you know family offices that are supporting us. So um, in order to um, get more paying customers, we have decided to go global. And once we go global, the training of electricians becomes a challenge. Uh, so we are working on a remote training software so that electrician, any like, one of our pilot is in Sierra Leone in Africa. So we want to be able to train electricians there without spending a lot of money on travel. So we are coming up, uh, we are working with a software solution to train and do remote diagnostics. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have a question from Larry who is ask, asking, so do you have a plan to venture in East Africa? Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, we, um, we are uh, talking to a partner all for one in uh, Syria, Leon. Um, uh, I think which is more in West Africa. Um, uh, but we are very open to uh, expanding. Once we've figured out our supply chain to Africa, we are open to expanding anywhere in Africa. Uh, I also have another question from Kylie West. What specifically differentiates your products from other solar products? Sure. So, um, others, uh, one of the key um, applications or key component of our uh, device is uh, that we don't use a SMF battery, but in turn use a, a lithium ferrophosphate battery, which makes the whole solution very compact and portable. Um, as opposed to a huge diesel um, uh, generator, this is a, almost like one tenth the size of it, and hence it's uh, very portable and easily uh, manageable. Um, our product is very modular, and parts of it can be uh, easily 
uh, replaced and hence maintenance is uh, pretty uh, comfortable. And then um, I think those are the two main differences that we have. I mean, of course, there are features of lithium ferrophosphate battery, which makes it better than SMF battery, uh, like charging cycle and um, uh, the time to which it has to be uh, every, uh, I mean, how often it has to be recharged and things like that. Okay, great. So could you talk about your customer conversion? So what's the turnaround time and the cost of customer acquisition? These are questions from Marcy. Sure. So we are mostly uh, operating um, in a referral model uh, right now. Um, so uh, for example, um, uh, we were referred to Sevai and uh, we've been using Sevai and, uh, in, in Trichy, Tamil Nadu as, as our impact lab of sorts to try out business, different business models. Um, given that Sevai works with 150,000 women in that area, we've been able to uh, find a solution and scale with them. Uh, and hence, that's, uh, that's why we have 51 Aurora uh, power hubs there because uh, we found 1,000 women who are trained in garment manufacturing and have garment orders and just need the hub. So um, um, it has been a one-time investment, but uh, we're scaling pretty well there. Um, if we go into a new region like Africa, uh, I think the conversion time has been more like four to five months. Uh, uh, from the first conversation to actually installation. I think the first conversation happened in May and we, we are looking at an installation of like January next year. So out of the country is long. Um, the cost itself has been pretty minimal because um, we're not going out in marketing. We're just going with the referral system. So uh, most of it is about the time spent in uh, convincing the customer. Um, on uh, helping us scale in other countries here. Great. And there's also another question here around what kind of community partners do you work with in building the hubs or just New York? Sure. So one of the uh, main community partner that we uh, uh, work with is nonprofit organizations on the ground that are focused on um, providing livelihood opportunities for people. So that is one of our main partners. Um, the second uh, uh, important type of partners that we partner up with is manufacturing MSMEs. Uh, may, may be manufacturing in garments, textiles, threads. Um, uh, it could also be a welding machine. It could be a de-husking uh, device, um, uh, a rice de-husking uh, de device. It could be any, any of the manufacturing uh, plant which needs reliable source for electricity and we, um, we replace the diesel generator with uh, this one. So it could be any any manufacturing partner who is looking for a reliable source of electricity. Thank you. So my closing question would be around, so could you also take us through your impact working with women who co-design some of these solar products and just how much of an impact have you in terms of uh, improving their livelihood uh, and also creating job opportunity for them? Could you talk about that? Sure. So uh, the salary of these women have been, uh, um, they were close to zero, but um, they have been able to um, grow from zero to um, uh, earning about 400 to $500 a year, which is still not much, but uh, given that these women come from a background of agrarian crisis and have been close to farmer suicide, they have happily taken up alternate jobs and worked with us and come out of debt cycle. So uh, the investment that we are making is actually help, helping them get out of suicides and sustain themselves and break their debt cycles. Um, so uh, all these uh, women have been able to pay up their loans and work with us. Women that joined us in 2018 are still with us even through COVID when there was a gap, they did not go find alternate jobs. They came back and uh, joined us again. And we are really proud of that. Uh, there's a very enterprising community. So they've been able to go out and uh, 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 look at innovative ways in which the Aurora Power Hub can be used or, or the solar street lights that they manufacture can be used. So very enterprising and um, um, uh, entrepreneurial community. Um, uh, so that is making a social shift in the equations because uh, women are not used to working in electronics in that region. And it's it's been a huge social change. Like 
we we hear of women talking about how their mother-in-laws praise them and things like that, which is very unique for um, uh, uh, cul uh, culturally from that community. And um, most important thing is from the money they earn, they're taking care of their health. Um, uh, and um, th there were a lot of issues where they couldn't take care of their health and mental health is a big issue there. And we've been able to help them sustain by teaching them stuff in well-being, human rights and more here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Savita. That was very great presentation and also the work you're doing out there. We really appreciate you. So I'll just uh, request if you can put your, maybe your email address there and uh, any participant or investor in the room who could be interested in connecting with you later on, uh, feel free to get in touch with me or Savita directly and can always connect you with an umbrella that you can take the conversation further. Yes, so, I just put my email there. Thank you so much. So thank you so much. So our second enterprise is Orja, a renewable energy company based in India. This female-founded business is tackling problem of expensive diesel-based energy sources that contribute to low crop yield and agricultural income. Clementine should, will be presenting for us today and kindly take it up. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Alan. Um, first of all, I'd also like to echo uh, Savita's comments that we're really glad to be part of the Sankalp community for the first time, actually, and to be able to present our work today. Um, so I will be, uh, yeah, I'll be glad to tell you a bit more about Uja's work. It's actually, uh, we're actually working with similar beneficiary profiles to what uh, uh, Aurora also does. So some of this will be a little familiar. Our aim is to increase uh, the income and livelihoods of smallholder farmers specifically those farmers who are reliant on diesel, uh, obviously a fossil fuel, and to help them transition away from that and towards a more sustainable future. Um, so we focus specifically on the agricultural value chain, where uh, you can see here some of the challenges that millions of smallholder farmers face. Um, here I'm talking more about the northern parts of the country, but the other, same things apply for eastern parts and of course many other uh, you know, countries in the global south. So in India, we have about approximately 30 million farmers who rely on diesel. Uh, they use that for irrigation, but also for milling and other activities on the agricultural value chain. Uh, it's a big recurring expense for them. It uh, really restricts their ability to, uh, to grow cash crops, to uh, irrigate effectively, and thus uh, has an effect on their ultimate income and their livelihoods. And uh, similarly, uh, again, a bit further on the agri-value chain in the cold storage uh, side of things, basically there are virtually no facilities for cold storage. So farmers are not able to maintain the quality of any perishable produce and there are high uh, post-harvest losses that result. So in all of these different segments, uh, there's one sort of problem that perpetuates, which is that there are alternatives, but farmers are not able to afford them. And that's even with you know, pretty uh, aggressive capital subsidies. So the solution that Uja has come up with is that we are providing uh, farming services in these three different verticals currently uh, to, you know, to solve this problem for smallholders. So first of all, we provide uh, an irrigation service. Here we sell water as a service to uh, farmers based on their consumption, so based on the cubic meters of water that they pump. And we're able to achieve at least 20% saving compared to the diesel price. Uh, but actually these days more like 40% because the diesel fuel prices have been skyrocketing. Uh, we also have a milling service. Uh, this is used for different types of uh, cereal crops, for, uh, but also for spices and other things that require uh, pulverizing. Uh, like the irrigation service, it's also solar powered. It's also available on farm. And here we achieve typically about 50% saving compared to the diesel milling rates. And more recently, we launched a cooling service. Here, farmers pay per crate per day that they store in the solar powered cold storage. And uh, this is available at the market at the Monday so that they can uh, extend the shelf life of their produce and fetch a higher uh, selling price. The business model between, behind all three of these services is pay per use. Uh, so what that means is uh, farmers don't own the asset, Urja owns the asset, we invest in the infrastructure. Uh, typically, these are pretty small solar projects around five kilowatt peak per project. And we continue to own and operate all those systems and then maintain them for their full lifetime. So that means farmers don't get involved in the O&M. So we uh, take care of any maintenance and repair issues. And then we sell them these uh, solar powered farming services at affordable tariffs. Um, so there are various uh, benefits for the end user. I already talked about cost savings. 
but also under pay per use um, there, you know, these services are provided to them year round hassle free so there's no more, you know, for example, hauling their heavy diesel pumps to the field and back that that's all over. And instead they have, a, you know, they take the services from us. And uh, the probably the most important feature of this business model is it's designed to be inclusive. So we actually work with you know very last mile, uh, low income, bottom of the pyramid farmers who earn around five to seven thousand rupees per month per household, um, and uh, and yeah, enable them to access solar powered technology. Our target market at the moment, you can see in this uh, tiny map up here. So we're actually active in Uttar Pradesh and in Bihar at the moment, with plans to expand to other eastern states. Um, I think the slide's gotten a little messed up, but the uh, we're also working with BOP marginal farmers, like I just said. So typically they have one to two acres of land holding um, and we're helping them to expand, to grow you know, more seasons and more crops than they were able to do before. And you can see on the right hand side here, you know, the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, this there's a huge market size here, which is mostly untapped. Uh, you know, we're talking about even in each district, millions of potential adopters who are reliant on diesel today and have no viable alternative. How we actually operate this. Uh, so like I said, Wuja invests in the infrastructure. Uh, in each village, we have a different offerings uh, depending on the needs. So typically we have irrigation and milling in all villages that we work in. And then we also add the cold storage service if it's required, uh, which means that farmers will be growing horticultural produce in that area. So we cluster our projects together uh, and then we hire local operators who are themselves farmers and we upscale them so they then become the service providers. They also collect the payments and they sell for, uh, the services directly to other farmers in their community. And of course, we also have a bigger field team that does you know, all the other aspects of field operations from site identification to payment collections to impact monitoring. This is uh, our growing team. So there's two of us you know, who co-founded the company, my, my co-founder Amit uh, Saralgi, who's also, I think, on this call, uh, who brings 25 years of experience in banking and consulting and development uh, across three different continents. And I have a background in renewable energy research and consulting. The two of us actually met on a climate change workshop about uh, six, seven years ago. And then we've built a stellar team. Uh, you can see they have, they cover lots of different functions that I just mentioned. So from the engineers, to the you know, social development workers uh, to, who are able to connect with communities to those with a uh, background in agriculture. And then of course our operators that we hire, hire directly in the communities. So what have we achieved? Since we started the very first irrigation service project, which was at the end of 2018, so about three years ago now. So we've deployed 35 projects that have reached about 3000 people so far. Um, we. Uh, yeah, so you can see here some of the impact metrics that we're tracking. We've seen that in a year of uh, after adopting solar irrigation, farmers were able to increase their agricultural productivity by about 15% on average and increase their, their agricultural income by almost 30%. That's with just adoption of one service in one year. So we think that actually we can go much beyond that. Um, and now we're working to scale that up, which means for us uh, scaling up the number of projects. So we've recently um, partnered with new investors. We have uh, just uh, raised an equity investment with Schneider Electric's Energy Access Fund Asia. And we're also being supported by the Water and Energy for Food Challenge in South and Southeast Asia. And other uh, and Dune Foundation was actually our first uh, big investor. And uh, we're using their funds to scale up. So we're, over the next 18 months, we'll be deploying about 120 solar projects, uh, focusing on the, the three or four states of Northern and Eastern India. And we've also won uh, quite a few recognitions uh, for this innovative uh, business model and the, the impact of the services that we're providing, including most recently the UN Best Small Business Award, um, and the Keeling Curve Prize, the SIFE Award, and some others. So how we plan to scale up, like I said, is through deploying a large number of projects. Uh, we're hoping to reach 150 pro uh, ozones, which will comprise about six, 700 projects in the next three years. Um, we will initially be expanding in India over the next couple of years and then hope to also do basically to go global. Uh, so starting within the region, uh, you know, the South Asia region, but also uh, into African countries. So uh, shout out to those of you who uh, want to talk about potential expansion partnerships. And we also plan to go digital and to go beyond the energy based services that we provide and start introducing digital innovations that will plug some of the other gaps that smallholder farmers are facing. So I will stop there. Um, 
and let you guys ask any questions that you might have. So thank you so much again for the opportunity to present. And uh, yes, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Clementine, for that presentation. Really insightful. So I'll go straight to the question. So the first question that's come coming in is around challenges to enforce the pay per use contract. So given that there are uh, numerous and low, there are low value. So how do you mitigate that, that aspect of pay per use contracts for the ones, for the people using the uh, services? Okay, so I think, um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think we have to differentiate between pay as you go and pay per use, they're different business models. So just for complete clarity, so pay as you go, you would have a contract where you might pay something upfront and then eventually you would pay back the, you know, the, the company for the product that you're probably leasing and eventually going to own, right? So there's a contract in place. And then it's about repayment cycles and it's basically like providing someone a loan. What pay per use is a different model where there's no investment made by the end user and the company continues to own the assets. So we don't have a contract. It's based on utilization. So if I uh, become a member and I start using the irrigation service, so we do actually charge a small upfront fee for as an indication of buy-in so that someone can become a member of the service and then they can use it and pay only according to their consumption. So there's no contract in that sense. We collect membership fees to indicate the buy-in and then uh, it's based on the utilization of the service. So if I didn't use the service in a given month, I won't be paying anything. Um, so yeah, so it's not about uh, withholding or respecting contracts in this sense. It's more actually for us about pushing up the utilization to a certain extent so that the business becomes economically viable. All right. And the second question is around uh, with this model, it's a bit uh, challenging to get to the level of break-even point. So could you just take us through uh, what, why are you seeing yourself in being in a position of break-even? And also, how many units will that translate to? Okay, so yes, it's a capital intensive model because you know we have to invest in a lot of infrastructure. Um, so typically, depending on the type of project, whether it's a irrigation project or a milling project or a cooling project, there are, there's different you know payback periods for each, but we look at them as a whole. So as a cluster of projects, uh, which you know has a, cert a certain number of projects would be in a cluster. Um, so, on the organization uh, as a whole, we project that we'll reach break even about two years from now, uh, when we reach, I think, about uh, 25 clusters. So, I mean, yeah, what that means in, in practice is, you know, it's about the certain threshold number of users that we would have reached, at which point we would be able to have sufficient uh, revenues that would cover both the operational costs and, you know, recover the initial investment while also covering the overheads of the organization. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, uh, the break, the operational break even is expected sometime in about two years from now. Great. And then there's a question around, uh, do you have training program for technicians? So how do you onboard the technicians? What sort of training do you provide to them and uh, what level of background that you do before you get them to be part of your team? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, we hire locally as much as possible. So. With technicians specifically, we've, uh, I mean, yeah, we've, we've hired technicians from different places in the past. Um, of course, a lot of them come from our industry, you know, similar organizations. Uh, so what kind of training we provide them? Yeah, it depends. Uh, if they're, you know, learning something quite from scratch, we have our own, you know, uh, technician training manuals that we use. Most of the training is provided on the job, you know, uh, in the field once they actually start and they learn from our more experienced uh, engineer. Um, However, I just wanted to add that um, we are actually planning to develop our own training programs for people with no technical background, specifically for women farmers, to engage them part-time in the uh, agricultural value chain, not only as technicians, but also as collections agents and in other uh, field operations functions. You know, women in these areas have other uh, obligations and responsibilities, so working full-time can be challenging. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Savita, I dropped you a message about connecting about this, but I think other organizations that are working on this, you know, last mile training opportunities for women specifically, happy to like connect with you guys and share experiences and that would be great. So I know I've just thrown your question back at you, but that's what we do. Great. And a question around, how do you handle non-payment? Non how do we handle non-payment? 
Uh, okay, so I mean, we have uh, our so all the uh, all of the service charges are supposed to be paid on the day of use. So post paid, you know, based on the meter reading if there is one, uh, and paid to the local operator. Now, in practice, obviously, farmers have very seasonal income; they're not always able to pay on the day. So uh, during COVID, we introduced a 15 day credit period in recognition of the fact that our customers are economically vulnerable and not always able to pay immediately. Uh, so you know it's kind of balancing the need for the company to get paid, but also the need, you know, the consumers varying cash flow. So yeah, they have a 15 day credit period. Um, we actually have fairly low non-payments. Um, it's to do with, you know, building a relationship of trust with the community over a period of time. Now, of course, we have a few cases where someone has not paid for, you know, consistently despite several reminders. So uh, in that case, we may opt to suspend the service uh, and we, you know, we may prevent them from taking any more services until they have repaid their dues. Um, but fortunately, we haven't had, uh, you know, very many cases like that. The sort of default rate has been very low. Sure. And there's another last question around, someone is curious to understand, one of the investors, uh, how do you, where do you get some of these assets? So is it sourcing them locally within the market that operate or most of them are imported? It's all, uh... Uh, yeah, no, fortunately we don't have to import anything. So in India, we have a pretty, you know, very established solar market supply chain. So all of the equipment is sourced domestically. Again, to be clear, we don't manufacture anything. We work with local suppliers. And we, you know, try to find the best quality equipment um, with also local supply chain and service centers so that, you know, to facilitate uh, in case things do go wrong and we need spares. Uh, and of course, we have our own teams who take care of the technical maintenance. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if you want to know a few names in, in, in solar irrigation, we're working a lot with Shakti pumps. Uh, in milling, we work with centrifugal and we did a cold storage project recently with EcoZen. So, yeah, so these are some of the domestic companies that we've partnered with. Thank you. Any closing question from the audience just before I wrap it up with the Clementine? You can mute yourself. If there's none, then you can move to the next enterprise. Meanwhile, uh, thank you so much, Clementine, for presenting. And uh, feel free yeah. to reach out to Clementine directly, or uh, I can also link you up with Clementine and uh, connect with her, and you can get to understand much more about what they're doing. You can also connect with them on Brella and have a one on one engagement. Uh, in the course of the Sanka Summit. Thanks a lot, Alan, and thanks everyone for your questions. Thank you. So our next uh, enterprise for the day is Big Girl. So Big Girl is an enterprise based in the United States and Mozambique, also having presence in Kenya. Big Girl distributes a full line of quality and sustainable menstrual products to girls and women in underserved global markets, coupled with high impact education services and transformative marketing campaigns. The enterprise is also female founded. You're welcome, Diana, to present. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I just want to also acknowledge the fact that I'm here with my COO, Audrey. Uh, so the both of us, we will be answering your questions after the presentation. So let me just share my screen if my computer behaves properly. So, and apologize if the desktop is a little bit messy, but I have 10,000 things here. Okay. Can you see my, my, um, my screen? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Awesome. Can you hear me well? Sure. Awesome. So uh, I just want to, um, uh, let me just go here. Okay. So B-Girl, um, we are a social venture that at our heart of the work that we do are women and girls. And why? Because um, maybe it's not very um, uh, known to everybody, but I, I'm pretty sure for the people in this in this group is something that is we know and we see in our communities that a lot of women and girls who live in very limited conditions, they don't have the means to protect themselves and to take care of their body of their menstrual period. And this creates a huge problem for them because if you don't have anything to protect your body, Basically, you are completely trapped on it. So, and if you cannot access to something that allows you to move freely when you have your flow, you can't go to school, you can't go to work. And literally what happens is that most likely you're going to be vulnerable to, uh, you know, to get married uh, young and you know, just completely perpetuate those cycles of poverty. 
So that's, that's the root of the problem that we want to work on. We want to make sure that every woman and girl feels comfortable in their skin, feels comfortable in their body, because it's just not fair that the nature of your body is the thing that is on the way of you achieving opportunities. So there's many ways we can solve this type of problems, but we focus on design and products as well. Why? Because uh, through products, we can completely reframe all these conversations and we use it by, uh, we use design, industrial design, product design to create products to educate. So we have the smart cycle tool, which is same as you have an app on a phone, this one is a, digi is a manual app. And we teach girls and boys how to count the menstrual cycle. It's not a birth control tool, it's more like literally in body education. Uh, we also have a whole suite of, uh, with that type of products, we also have um, education packages that we sell mainly to NGOs. Um, the second line of the work that we have is the ownership part of your body, right? So it, that's everything that it goes to manage your flow. So we have cups, we have period panties, and we have sanitary pads. And lastly, we have the transformational marketing because it's really important that everybody feels very comfortable talking about periods. So I'm going to focus just in our main product, which is the period panty. I know that um, it may not look super, you know, like it, this is not rocket science, it's just a panty. But the really cool thing about it is that this is innovation. Like this is, this is, this is as good as it gets when it comes to period panties. Um, our panties are made with like very high materials like uh, dry fit, elastics, um, leak proof. So as you can see, the technology is a pocket. So imagine a panty that it has a pocket underneath, that it has a leak proof barrier and a mesh on top. So literally you create a pocket that you can insert anything absorbent there. The panty comes with a towel. Nevertheless, you can insert toilet paper, cloth, pieces of torn clothes. And I think this is really important because a lot of girls and women in difficult scenarios, that's what they do actually to manage their period. They find anything that is absorbent and they have to stuff it on their panty. So this is just a way of telling you, you know, girl, what you're doing is fine. It's just that we're doing it with this. You can do it better. You can do it more comfortable. You can do it uh, more ergonomic. So, and also really important to mention, this is a patented technology. And uh, this, this is really important because, you know, you may have another type of players in the game that may be interested in the technology as well, such as Kimberly Clark or Johnson & Johnson. Um, so it's really important to, to highlight that even though this is a huge problem, it's also an enormous opportunity. So globally, this is a $40 billion market. But nevertheless, one of every three girls around the world, they don't have access to this product. So we cannot just think that we are going to migrate all that population to start using disposables because then also the environmental impact is huge. So this growth and this explosion and in innovation literally is happening in the United States and Europe where you have all these reusable products going into the menstrual market. What we want to do is to bring all this innovation in other places where actually this type of products are more needed, where you don't have access to other products, where uh, due to limitations on geography, actually, you know, it's better for you to have a product that you don't have to be buying on the daily basis. So that's what we want to do. We want to bring a really good design products, high quality to emerging economies. So just to give you a, a, a summary of the landscape where all these women and girls live. So Right now, you have 25% of the population of our potential market lives in emerging economies, sorry, in developed economies. That's not our goal, even though our company is registered in the United States, it's more like a brand statement. Um, we have, we focus on two other chunks of the population, which are 10% of the population that lives in very difficult conditions, humanitarian settings, where users cannot pay for the product, period. And then we have the other 65%, which is the base of the pyramid that lives in emerging economies. So that's where the, where the future of uh, B-Girl is going to be. So this is our business model. Um, basically, you have two tiers of business. You have one that is focused on serving NGOs, where the last uh, the end, uh, user doesn't pay for the product because they live in very particular conditions where it's very inaccessible. And then you have the other side of the business, which is the B2B commercial, where the end user actually pays for the product. And um, basically, if I can tell you my, like, what's the dream of B-Girl in the future? 
we literally want to be the Nike of menstrual protection in emerging economies, like super cool, really, you know, innovative products. We want to be the sustainable to go product and brand in emerging economies. And we want to do it through really cool messaging. So everybody feels comfortable in their skin. We use a lot of, um, you know, so we have this two line of businesses and we use grants for the center, which is more the education piece, like all about this, uh, making sure that people speak about periods in a positive way. Um, what are, how are we different to anybody else? So basically, um, Procter & Gamble, they only focus on disposable ones and they don't do uh, education programs. Uh, things, uh, night, kids and salt and all these really cool brands who are really innovated, they're only in the US. So nothing of that innovation is trickled down to emerging economies. And lastly, um, we actually have, compared to other players on the market, uh, like Afri Patents and Africa, we actually have a completely different product offering, which is the period panty, a two-in-one solution that um, not only that is very innovative in it, on itself, but we also use a lot of really cool um, social marketing that goes with it. Um, traction up to now, uh, we have more than 50 NGO clients, uh, 30, more than 30% recurring, really um, it, you know, a, a large variety of, of uh, sizes. Um, we have uh, more than 45,000 followers in, in Mozambique and more than 10,000 in Kenya. And up to now, we have put more than 2,500 products in the hands of girls. Um, we have uh, a really, you know, we have been picking up on sales, um, mainly since we moved to Mozambique. And we are hoping to triple our revenue this year, uh, reaching more than uh, $890,000 in revenue. Um, where who do we stand right now in terms of fundraising? So we already know the way forward in order to really get to the commercial state. So we basically already understand how to sell to NGOs and that side of the business is, is more, nailed, uh, more, more or less nailed. We are, going to work, we are going to move to commercial. Why? Because of the future. That's the future of Big Run. That's the future for anybody who wants to do market-driven approaches. So um, we are right now, we are going through, we just closed a, sa uh, a safe for uh, 450 and I think we are about to close it to the 500 that we have hoped. Um, and uh, we have for, we are raising uh, for 2022, an equity raise for 1.5 million, which we already have 50% more or less in soft commitments. Why we're going to use that money for? We are going to use that money to have all the learning that we have from our commercial experience and go into Kenya. Uh, it's a market that we really want to explore. We already have been doing some research and some testing, and that's what we're going to do in collaboration with Kasha, which is another uh, organization, social enterprise that is female driven and uh, female focused. Um, our team, basically we work with a HQ team that is well seasoned and with a lot of experience, and we mentor our team on the ground. So we have experience in industrial design, in uh, grant management and education and gender. We have experience in marketing and finance. And this team mentors the team on Mozambique, and, which basically is a, a very vibrant uh, young team that we are uh, mentoring from zero. We have advisories um, such as Deloitte, uh, Kimberly Clark, uh, Halcyon. And in our board, we also have um, a lot of the people that had invested on us already, they belong to the board. Um, and lastly, I would like to leave you with the last slide, which is extremely uh, important because that's the name of the brand. Um, that quote was from a girl in Tanzania. And her name is Alfonsina. And she said, this was back in 2012, that the thing that she liked the most about the pads back then, the product haven't evolved this much, was that she felt proud to be girl. And that is what is at the heart of this business. We want every woman and girl who has a hold on one of our products to feel proud to be who she is, to be happy to be walking on her skin. So that's basically what we are here and all this team is rooting for, for making sure that we can repeat this experience in every single girl around this planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana, for great presentation. So really quickly, I'll jump to my first question would be uh, from the audience that, why are you targeting Kenya as your secondary market after Mozambique? So just a response. And the second question, maybe just, let me just combine. The second question be around your revenue. So what your revenue spread between the B2B market that you're targeting and the 
the other segment of 10%, which is more of a low income yeah. settlement. So how is the two revenue spread faring sure. on? Sure. Audrey, please take the, the, the questions. Sure. Hi, thanks. I'm Audrey, the COO of B Girl. Um, for, for the qu first question about Kenya, we conducted a few years ago market research in seven countries in Sub Saharan Africa, where we were looking at the response to the product and willingness to pay. And we identified a few as the, the, the top potential markets. Um, Mozambique was actually relatively high, and we had grant funding to subsidize our launch into the market there. And we developed out really just this whole ecosystem of market partners that we need in order to reach the end user. And so we, we were able to develop and test that market. And But the Mozambique market has a limited opportunity to scale in terms of revenue. And so we're looking to build there to advance to a market that has the opportunity for um, for scale and growth. And Kenya was the top market that we identified. And so not only in terms of response to the products, um, the, the business landscape, particularly for menstrual products, is very friendly right now. And overall consumer willingness to pay for the products and response to the products um, made this particular market um, a, a really, really good opportunity, coupled with Kasha as our partner. So Kasha does mobile commerce. So you can order, even if you just have a simple non-smart, non phone, you can order on your um, on your phone and have any products delivered to your house. So this infrastructure already exists for that we can reach scale throughout the country and a great partner that shares both um, a commitment to social impact, but with business as the vehicle to get there. And we are we have um, conducted a pilot with Kasha and they said that our launch ad with them was the most successful ad that they have had so far. And so we know that there is some really good initial um, opportunity there. And we are in conversations with them to be our national distributor as well so that we can scale beyond their retail platform. Um, and the second question was about the B2B market share or the B2B share of our revenue, right? So this, so we have B2B revenue. We sell to NGOs who distribute free of cost to girls in need. We also sell within markets to um, low and middle income consumers, primarily in urban areas. And to date, more than 90% of our revenue has been, um, has been from the B2B side. And we are in, and so we're increasing that, um, our projected revenue for next year, based on a deal that we're about to close with our distributor, is that that will, um, that will shift to commercial revenue being 10% of our market share next year, of, of our revenue share for next year. That's 2022. And then as we're growing and focusing on the growth within the commercial markets, we're projecting that to raise year on year um, until um, the commercial revenue actually surpasses the B2B side. Thank you so much for that. The next question is around, uh, there's a binding constraint around uh, in, in so many geographies around this matter and it's not being openly discussed uh, and health matter around menstruation. So how do you handle that in terms of your marketing or the language you're using out there to bring a more visibility and also create more uh, opportunity for your product to sell? Okay, so basically the way that we are going around is that um, there's a huge stigma to menstruation and especially because it's a very related to sexual reproductive health. So basically the way that we have been going around reframing menstruation and all these education packages and it's basically about body literacy. So even though we are talking about the same thing, you know, it's like making sure that people do understand how the menstrual cycle works and how this affects their sexual reproductive life, we go and we frame the problem as an issue of girls need to have access to information because they, it's better that everybody knows how their body works. So we call that body literacy. And also really important, when we talk about menstruation and, and, and when we frame it, we do it in a way that is very um, kind of like very inviting to people just to like, it's not really um, you know, on your face type of marketing. So how do we do it? We get influencers to talk about it really positively. We bring boys, we bring girls, and we, we actually go and talk to people at the government level. So we have top down, bottom up, and all around. So the top down is engaging with governments, speaking their language, making sure that they don't feel that they are being threatened, you know, that they don't feel that we are just imposing things. No, we're just talking about body literacy because it's good that everybody knows how their body works. So when demonstration is gonna come, nobody has the stains, you know, like accidents in their uniforms. 
they do understand that language, you know? So when we go on the, uh, on the bottom up, which is at the schools, we use exactly the same thing. So it's like trying to, to make sure that we are very uh, conscious where the trigger points for governments and for like gatekeepers, uh, religious, um, you know, uh, leaders and all that stuff, we, we know what the triggers are. So in our language and the way that we communicate, we always try to stay aside from that. And lastly, social marketing, for us, if there's anything that I can share with everybody here, is like go with influencers. Like the, the right now, the young Africa is even if even if it's limited or or a lot, the access to uh, social media is crucial because that's those are the role models. That's the, the the people that the youth is following. So try to engage them, bring them on 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 board, and you will see how far it goes every time they talk positively about something. So social media works really well. Influencers, Instagram, all those things to make sure that these conversations flow more naturally. Thank you. And considering that your target market is also in uh, low-income settlement, which is so much fragmented and so many I would call like shops or back-end can you call kiosks spread around. So how do you plan to strategize uh, around distribution? What's your distribution strategy going forward? So there's two very things, two very important things to say here. It's like you have two users, the one who are able to pay for the products and the one who don't. So we are right now working on understanding how we get to the user that can pay for the product. Right now in Mozambique, we have a partnership with a, sto with a retail store that has presence all over the country and is a fashion store. Why? Because the type of product that we have, instead of selling it in kiosks, like you will set sanitary pads for us was better to sell it through like retail stores that they were like more like fashion stores. So that was like, a, it took a while for us to be able to understand what was the best channel. And that's the, what, the one that we have identified in Mozambique. The next steps for us right now is like, for example, as we are going in, in Kenya, we're going to be working with, with uh, Kasha. And I know that there are some other conversations with other channels. Like we, we are not going to rebuild the, like invent the wheel. We're going to use what other partners already are using so we can tap into those channels to reach the end, uh, the end mile. Thank you I'll, so much. I'll add to that, um, the M commerce, so mobile commerce, ordering on your phone and having it delivered to you, the networks, particularly in Kenya, are really excellent. There's some amazing partners who are doing work to build those supply chains to harder to reach areas, because you're absolutely right. The, the further you get to the last mile, the more fractured the, um, the outlets become and the channels become, and that makes it much more expensive to reach consumers who have less ability to pay. And so working through these, these, this infrastructure that exists already is a huge benefit. And we know that we have to build this ecosystem of partners, particularly for menstrual products and particularly for slow moving products that by nature, they save our consumers money, yeah. but it means that we have to be really savvy from the business side to make sure that we're building a sustainable supply chain all the way to reach them. Thank you so much, Audrey and uh, Diana for great presentation and for responding to the question to our satisfaction. So, uh, I, I would just like to once again remind the investors and participants in the room that you would uh, connect direct with the Big Girl Umbrella or I could connect you directly with them in case you'd want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation just to understand their work much more in depth. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, all the best. And Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So our next uh, enterprise for today is uh, Farmers on Wheels from Nigeria. Nigeria. This social enterprise was founded in 2018, working with smallholder farmers in rural areas, providing access to input services and market, marketing enabling them to increase their productivity, yield and income. I would like to invite Jocelyn to take it up. Thank you so much, Alan, um, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, uh, everyone that um, you know, I is a participating in this um, slumber party. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, put it in presentation. Okay. okay, okay, great. So let me start with um, about 70% of Nigerian populations is involved in agriculture. Um, it's either in production or in um, value addition. 
over 90% of that population are smallholder farmers and over 90% of that population are small are in rural communities. So um, farm and wheels works with smallholder rural farmers, um, you know, providing them access to um, the interventions they need. Eight out of 10 farmers that uh, we've you know, interviewed during our various town hall meetings has um, experienced um, lack of access to quality input, um, low yield due to re reusing um, seeds, um, post harvest loss, um, loss to middlemen, and unable to um, produce enough food that would you know, last them from one farming season to the next. And um, so we came up with this disruptive market solution where we provide our farmers with um, direct access to a comprehensive package of the resources they would need from production to sales. So um, we start with um, providing them with good agronomic and agribusiness practices, training on that, and provide them access to credit. Um, our credit is at 0% interest rate. Um, and then we provide them access to inputs, uh, which includes seeds, fertilizer, agrochemicals, um, you know, and then we provide them access to markets. So the whole package includes seeds, um, fertilizer, agrochemicals, training, hands-on extension services, access to insurance, access to storage, um, access to credit facility, and finally access to market linkages. Niger State, we are in north central part of Nigeria, uh, in a state called Niger State, which has 2.1 million registered farmers under cooperatives uh, with an average income of $500 per farmer, which is about 1.6 billion um, revenue for the state. Um, but our um, SOM is um, for 150 uh, farmers that in the two local government that we have a presence in. And in those local governments, we, are, we have a presence in eight communities in the local government, which is about 150,000 uh, smallholder farmers with uh, 75 million in SOM. And uh, we have the revenue generating model. The first one is the registration fee from our farmers, where the farmers pay a registration fee, a subscription fee every year um, to be part of the program for the year. And we have... Um, the revenue generated through input distribution. So we partner with um, input uh, companies. Um, so we leverage on that partnership um, to get this input at discounted rate uh, between uh, 25 to 30%, and uh, which is not distributed to our farmers at prevailing market price. Uh, and then um, the harvested produce. So after the production part, um, we during harvest, we offtake and this um, harvested produce are supplied to our agro-processing and, um, partners who often take this produce from us at uh, depending on uh, the market between um, 30, 40, depending on how fluctuating it is. So our model, business model is in two, um, two ways. We have the social part and then we have the enterprise, hence the social enterprise. So the social part is where we, you know, we supply the farmers with the input directly to them in their communities. We provide them access to the services, which includes the training, the hands-on extension services on credit at 0% interest rate to them within their communities. 60% of our farmers are women. So we are very, very gender focused. And um, in terms of the enterprise part is where we um, of take um, from our farmers and um, even farmers um, in the communities that we work with, are not even um, members of Farm on Wheels communities. And um, we, you know, the direct access uh, to market that we provide for those farmers as well. And also our partnership with SMEs. So this is where the business part, which is the enterprise, um, comes in. It is important to note here that our transactions are completely cashless. So we provide inputs to these farmers and they pay us back with farm produce equivalent. And this has enabled us to have a recovery rate of 100% till date. So um, we have a unique edge um, over other competitions in the market. Um, we've identified through our m and &E the five major points where we have unique edge over other competitions. We have the input distribution where we distribute when we promise we're going to distribute. We have the interest rate, the payment method, the market linkages. So these are where we have very strong um, you know, reputations amongst our farmers. Until um, date, we've trained over 4,000 far uh, farmers through community by community program, 
we're running a radio program currently that is estimated to reach 2 million uh, farmers. We've um, given inputs to over 1,000 smallholder farmers uh, in 160 tons of inputs, and we've produced over 2,500 tons of rice and soybeans. 60% of our farmers, like I mentioned before, are smallholder farmers. We've enabled our farmers increase their production by 100%, yield over 80, income between 50 and 60, and reduce their post harvest load drastically by 20% uh, thereabout. Um, so we've also uh, managed to maintain from 2018 um, to 2020 a positive EBITDA margin. Um, 2020 was a bit difficult because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, which um, we experienced a little dip, but we are picking up in the year 2021. Um, so we're looking for um, funding um, into different uh, uh, funding channels um, through grants and debt. Um, the grant will be to increase our production capacity by reaching um, 3,000 um, smallholder farmers. And the debt is we're looking to raise because we are expecting in this season uh, about 500 tons of rice and soybeans. So we're looking for uh, funding in that vehicle to um, uptake those produce. So um, we have 11 staff members. Uh, six of them are extension workers are in the field. Um, two of them are, you know, field workers, and we have our top management, which includes myself. Um, I have uh, I'm a Mandela Washington Fellow, um, Eternal Mellow alumni. I am a GSBI alumni, uh, Mandela Washington, and an Echo in Green Fellow, uh, also a Deep Prize awardee. So, but my uh, um, my major um, the part is in strategy development and implementation. Uh, Mr. Rinze has over 11 years and finance and uh, distribution as he was in the banking sector for over 11 years. And Mr. Jenny, uh, Ms. Jennifer is uh, head of field operations and uh, in terms of crop production, which we are involved in currently. So I want to share this impact story um, just because of my time. Ms. Lydia has been with us from 2018. And when we started, she had two kids that were out of school. So for the first year that she worked with us, um, she increased her production capacity or an income. And in that regard, in that way, she was, after that first session, cycle, she was able to send two of her children back to school. And during off season, she started a kiosk where she, you know, market small agricultural products that she, um, you know, from the income she de generated from um, working with us. Uh, our impact um, in the next, we're looking to um, reach 100,000 farmers in the next 10 years, um, increase um, food production by 1 million tons, increase uh, economic activities in these communities, employ more youth, get more women um, involved in the agricultural sector. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm very open to any question you might have. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for your presentation. Glad to hear the great work you're doing with farmers in Nigeria. My first question, our first question is coming around. So you're working with farmers in terms of giving them inputs. And the question is around in case of drought or where the farmers aren't able to get the produce during the harvest. So how do you recover the input costs that you had given them? Okay, so um, the process of selecting our farmers and their farms is we have our field officers, they go to the farms, they meet with these farmers and we map their farmlands. So um, we have good agronomists that go for this farm mapping. So for start, we try to ensure that the farmlands are located um, in where such issues would not come up. Secondly, um, we offer insurance services. We partner with AXA Mansad, uh, which is an insurance company in Nigeria who provides them with this insurance um, uh, coverage. And it is a criteria to work with us. So if you want to work with Farm on Wheels, you have to have insurance. You have to have your farm insured. And um, so that is how we've been able to mitigate um, you know, that. Alan, I think you're on mute. Sorry, uh, sorry, Justin. So uh, my question is around: How do you source for the input that you give to the farmers? Do you aggregate them beforehand? I know you mentioned around your work with the, the insurance to mitigate around the risk of loss of harvest, but now around the inputs, how do you aggregate them better? 
Okay, um, for inputs, uh, like I said, we partner with input companies and um, we also in partnership with IITA Abuja office who helps us to also develop the seeds that we supply or we distribute to our farmers. So uh, we leverage on partnership with these input companies to source for um, the inputs we distribute to our farmers. Secondly, we are also working on producing um, our own seed. We've started our seed multiplication process. Um, hopefully we'll be um, harvesting our first um, seed uh, next month. And um, we have also been been, um, given provisional certificate for seed um, manufacturing. So we are also looking at, um, you know, producing our own seeds and, you know, uh, also region specific fertilizer blending, which is also part of our long term um, strategies. And around your scale, scale up plan, how do you see yourself as uh, the next secondary market? I know you mentioned around a thousand smallholder farmers that you're currently working with. Or which other secondary market do you want to target and what would be informing that decision? Okay, so um, we have two major target market, uh, which is the smallholder rural farmers who are in the part of production. And we have the... Um, um, the agro-processing companies, which is in the, in the part of value addition and processing. So um, we are in partnership with Olam, but in, in other words, we're also in partnership with NSM in Niger State, um, and we're currently onboarding small and medium enterprises that are into um, feed manufacturing. And we want to include them, um, you know, integrate them with the farmers so that we would have um, market all the time. There's continuous market for the um, produce that we get from our farmers. So as, as far as the uh, production side is increasing, also the access to market is also um, increasing. Thank you so much. Uh, Unless we have any other question from the audience, uh, any investor in the room would want to ask any other question, feel free to unmute and just go ahead. Do you have, do you have any question? I have a question, Chris. Sure, go ahead, please. Who is on um, the line? My name is Oluwale. Um, I'm, um, do I have to introduce myself? Can I just go ahead? Just go ahead, please. Okay, that's fine. My name is Oluwale. Um, so my question for you is that you said you have um, cooperatives in uh, in Niger states. Um, is it just one cooperative that you're working with, or you have um, a set of cooperatives collected together that you work with? Then um, all these cooperatives, how do you bring them together? Is it through the government or through uh, field workers? I mean, I want to know your acquisition strategy to know if, uh, you know, and how you operate. I think that's, a, that's my question. Okay, thank you, Luale, for that question. So um, we are in partnership currently with 58 cooperatives with average of 150 farmers per cooperative. And these cooperatives are in 58 communities across Niger State. That being said, we are in partnership with a Niger State Agricultural Mechanization and Development Agency, uh, which it has a network of um, cooperatives um, under them. So these cooperatives are spread across um, across the state. And this, uh, this organization um, enabled us to have access to genuine cooperatives, who also, um, which also gave us access to genuine farmers. So um, in terms of acquisition, that was our first step into, uh, you know, into a customer acquisition. And then secondly, um, every year we have new cooperatives joining us and for those cooperatives to join us they have to be referred by an existing cooperative so that way um the cooperative that is referring another cooperative would ensure that the cooperative they are referring already knows our method even before we go for the sensitization and the training they already know our model so uh and they would also um, um guarantee that cooperative that yes um this cooperative is genuine and understands our model so that is how um you know that is how and that has been working um very interestingly because um every year we get more cooperative uh, referrals than we can you know distribute inputs to 
Thank you so much, Jocelyn. That was a great presentation. And just getting to understand the market landscape also in Nigeria with your great work with farmers. Uh, I would just want you to drop off the call, uh, and uh, but kindly share your details, your email address, and uh, all the investors or the participants in the room would want to connect with Justin later on. Please do reach out to her, or you can uh, kindly just share your contact, and I would be able to connect you with her, and you could have a, a much lengthier conversation later on on Brella or on our, on other platform later on. Thank you so much. Thank you, so, Alan. Our next uh, enterprise for the day is WEIR, is an Indian-based social enterprise. They have developed a blockchain platform that revolutionized the post-harvest financing ecosystem through the integrated warehousing receipt financial platform. I would want to welcome Ashish to make the presentation for WEIR. Thanks, Alan. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot to the Sankal Forum for giving us uh, this platform to present our solution to a global network. I'm still muted. I'm audible, right, uh, Alan? Yes, I can yeah. hear you, Ashish. Yeah. So thanks a lot uh, once again. And uh, Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are World, uh, a blockchain-based agri-fintech startup solving the distress sale and post-harvest financing problem of Indian farmers, as well as going forward the emerging farmers, emerging countries' economies as well. So access of, to finance of the farmers is a stark reality known to everyone. But on top of that, most of us will be surprised to know that in the post-harvest segment, the access to finance is very, very major. In India's $200 billion of annual agriculture financing, less than 10%, around $15 billion, is only going towards post-harvest finance. And that creates huge problem for the farmers in terms of their stock holding capacity. Lack of financing forces farmers to sell their crop at the lowest price, which is available to them just after the harvest. And this cycle of sowing, harvesting, and distress sale keeps going on, as well as it makes them dependent upon the money lenders at, who lend them at a very high cost of interest as well. That's where worlds bring warehouse receipt finance intervention. So instead of Instead of selling at the time of when the prices are low just after the harvest, the farmers can store their commodities in a world affiliated warehouse. And on top of that, based upon that commodity deposit, which acts as a collateral, farmers are given 70% of the value of the crop as loan. There is no financial check, there is no land holding check, no other check is performed. And this enables this intervention helps farmers to avoid distress sale and go for a deferred sale when the prices are at the right stage and helps increase farmers' income in India by 25 to 40%. In some of the countries like Africa, we have seen that price farmers' income has gone up by up to 300% as well. And at the same time, it helps the banks to get an asset-backed portfolio for the banks. This intervention helps the farmers to get access in finance, at a low cost at their doorstep and in real time. And as I mentioned, I'll help them avoid distress sale. For benefiting this, we have created a blockchain infrastructure where each and every participant, the farmers or the farmer cooperatives, the warehouses, the lenders, as well as other agencies like collateral managers, they are on one single platform. That enables a paperless, personless, lending in the warehouse. The farmers don't need to visit a bank. There is no need to go that, go anywhere. The moment they bring their commodity to the warehouse, within a few minutes, they're able to access the finance in their deposited directly in their bank account. Not only that, we have also enabled by using blockchain certain properties, we have now also created a trading platform that these commodities which have been deposited in warehouse on which the farmers have availed loans can be sold at a later stage on the platform itself without the need to visit the warehouse as well. The farmers can sell these commodities 
at the at their home or from the farm as well by click of a single button and these interventions help farmers to get access to finance at a very low cost we are the lowest cost lender at 9% per annum when microfinance institutions are also charging 18 to 25% per annum rate of interest to the farmers the loan gets in the real time we are the first and only one the real time agriculture loan provider in india and that helps farmers to increase their income as well at the same time by using blockchain what we have done for the lenders and which helps lenders to unlock the capital is that we have reduced the risk profile of the borrowers we have ensured that the receipts which are generated on the platform the warehouse receipts are original there is no question of a duplicate lending against that and by bringing the cost of underwriting and cost of customer acquisition lower for the banks we are helping them extend into the market as well also we work with the government and help them in getting certain sick food security data from the platform as well we provide so world has become a platform on which each and every activity in the post harvest finance whether it's a custody that is in warehousing credit loans quality assurance and logistics solution as well as trade all come on the single platform to serve the interest of the farmers and this platform is offered to the participants which is banks the warehouses and the farmers as platform as a service the revenue our revenue comes from b2b participants like banks and warehouses we don't charge farmers any single penny for availing this service uh, for getting the loan from the banks of course when the farmers will trade there will be a small fee for that but as of now we don't charge any single penny to the farmers we are a integrated platform as i mentioned as opposed to fragmented platforms like uh, registries which issue warehouse receipts only or our trading platforms world is a single integrated platform in india as of today and in terms of traction we are present in 1400 warehouses of india having the largest aggregated capacity of 2 million metric ton on our platform also we have generated we have got more than 500 million dollar of deposits on the platform from farmers traders and governments which makes us the one of the largest blockchain platforms of india and the government of uh, maharashtra where we work with have allocated 300 million dollars for future lending to farmers through the platform we are working with the private as well as government organizations we are working with four lenders as of today and there are more than few lenders more than four to five lenders in the pipeline as of today two to three are at a very uh, significant uh, uh, stage the platform has gone won accolades across the globe both in india outside of india in the banking sector in the agriculture sector as well as into the blockchain sector right now we are doing warehouse receipt finance exclusively to farmers but we are also bringing now lending to small micro and sme enterprise into the segment and on top of that we are bringing decentralized finance so we are now going to be india's one and only centralized and decentralized finance fintech platform uh, this is already being launched into this quarter commodity trading the platform is being developed and we will launch in the next quarter um, of the means with the first quarter of 2022 and we are also looking at international expansion in markets like africa and southeast asia right now we are targeting the 15 billion dollar of warehouse receipt finance market and 100 billion dollar of commodity trade market in india but moving forward we are looking to target a 250 billion dollar of warehouse receipt finance and trade in emerging economies we are raising a 5 million dollar uh, token round by selling the tokens on our for our decentralized finance protocol and we are looking to target as i mentioned already 300 million dollar worth of a uh, lending facility has been provided so by end of 2022 we will be utilizing that and also we are looking to serve uh, from today 6000 farmers we are looking to serve more than 25000 uh, farmers by end of next year as of today we are 15 member member team uh, three of us are co-founders i come from finance background two of my co-founders have huge experience in it sector and we are supported by experts both in financial inclusion as well as in blockchain technology in silicon valley as well as in india and we are now looking forward to bring these through our servicing the farmers we are actually helping achieve some of the sdg goals like no poverty reduce inequalities in income etc and looking forward to bring more and more benefit to the farmers 
in the post harvest segment both in india as well as outside of india thanks a lot thank you so much ashish this is real uh, great end of resolving real challenge out there in the market so uh, quickly i just want to understand so how do you deal with the there's a question that has come in how do you deal with transportation to the warehouse are you lending at the warehouse or are you getting uh, this from the farm yet as of now uh, we are uh, lending on the in the uh, warehouse so farmers have to bring that but we have also developed a transport solution on our platform and we will be launching that when we launch the trading platform then the goods will be picked up directly in the farmland itself instead of asking the farmer to bring the goods to the warehouse thank you uh any other question from the audience i would welcome as we wait for that question the other question that i received was around uh, how do you deal with the quality control so the the produce has been brought to the warehouse how do you work around ensuring that there's a quality uh, level at that stage so there are three layers of quality check as of today on the platform two of them are mandatory the third one is optional so first one is the quality check at the warehouse level when the commodities reach the warehouse at that point the first level of quality check is done which is largely through a physical inspection at the secondary level there are as i mentioned in our platform there is um, provision for collateral managers and the collateral managers are second degree of check so they are sort of uh, auditors in that particular sense which may uh, which validate the quality so these are two compulsory checks which are available there is a third part which is optional and which some of the banks are asking for where we also get the lab reports for these commodities which are deposited in the warehouse uh there's a question around your lending rates sorry uh before i welcome uh any participant would want to pose any question so what interest rate do you charge and how does that compare with the current market interest rate so we we are charging the lowest one of the lowest rates being charged to farmers today we are charging at 9% per annum uh, which is just 3% more than prime lending rate in india and it is actually speaking less than um, so microfinance institutions in india charge 18 to 25% per annum we are charging just 9% per annum and as compared to money lenders who will end who charge something like 36 to 60% uh, we are around 25% of that thank you uh, any participant on the the audience would want to ask any question maybe as we wait for someone to ask any question where do you get the fund to lend at this very low interest rate i'm just curious to understand yeah so we have partnered with cooperative banks we have partnered um, uh, with government promoted i mean maharashtra state cooperative bank the largest cooperative bank of india we have also partnered with uh, district level cooperative banks name is not mentioned here and that's where the low rate of uh, finance comes uh, comes from great and around scale up plan so you now much more focused in in india in maharashtra uh, how would this be easily replicable in uh, maybe moving to other cities uh, within india and also just later on outside india so we are already present in, we are already present in five states of india so uh, most of the northern sorry most of the western india and the central india is covered on the platform as of today in terms of the state presence of course as we know that uh, india is a diverse con country and has different uh, sort of borrower profile in different uh, states as well so certainly there are certain uh, going to be replication will have to be adjust to the ground realities for the international expansion we are actually partnering with other fintechs in the respective countries so for example we are in talks with um, fintechs in uh, in indonesia and um, uh, turkey for getting this solution and they will be doing the ground work over there we will provide the technology solution so they have the experience of working in those markets than we have and that's that's how we are looking to expand thank you so much ashish unless we have any other question from 
the, the participants here, any investor with a question or anyone would want to ask any last question to Ashish? I would. Thank you so much for your presentation uh, and all the best. And uh, just as we close, I would want you to also share your email address here and feel free to get in touch with uh, any, any investor or participant would want to connect with you. Also, uh, any investor or participant in the session, please do reach out to me or to Ashish directly and we'll get you connected so that you can have a detail more in-depth conversation and just to understand how they are operating and their, their prospect going forward. Our sure. next enterprise, thank you so much, Ashish. Our next enterprise is uh, Folio Water. Uh, this is an enterprise that is based in Bangladesh. Folio Water's mission is universal access to clean drinking water to the low income communities. Uh, I'd want to welcome Rashid to take it away, please. Rashid. Thank you so much, Elan. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for everyone uh, attend this, this session and especially thanks to the Shankal Forum for inviting us Folia Water in this session. So first of all, the greetings from the Folia Water to everyone. And, and we'd like to uh, give our gratitude to the Shankal Forum to actually giving us the award for the uh, Shankal Global Award 2021. So we are very excited to have this award. So thank you so much. Uh, greetings to everyone. So should I start first? Yes, please. Should I start? Okay. So let me share. Share your screen, screen and go ahead. So, yeah, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. you can see your screen. So, welcome to our presentation, Folia Water. This is Mohammed Rashid. I am the CEO of Folia Water. The world first water filter for pennies, not dollar. So, we are creating a new one billion consumer food staples in clean drinking water category, like the in cleaner category, in liver, in liver, like boys, sun silk, and other, they are doing business in the one billion cleaner category. At the same time, the, in the beverage category, Coca Cola, Nestle, and other, doing the same business. So, Folia Water will create a new one billion uh, consumer health staples in clean drinking water category. So, 1.2 million people died for the contaminated uh, drinking water in 2007. And that causes for the virus, bacteria, and other pathogens from their, uh, from their water, and especially for the 3 billion working class population. So there are many water product purification ladder in the global. So middle class and the wealthy class population, they have the accessibility, and they, ha they have the affordability to buy the appliances, like the Puri, Kent, and other related product. But what about the 3 billion working class population? They doesn't have the safe drinking water uh, because of their affordability at the same time, the accessibility as well. So in, in Bangladesh particularly, uh, there are many, uh, many small, um, in many small uh, competition in the localized version, like you can see the bottle jar water. Uh, this is basically in the very localized version in a district or sub-district level, some water kiosk, People are actually taking the tea boil water and they drink it and some boil water. Well, all are actually contaminated according to the survey we have found. And as per the, our target group uh, uh, dynamics, we have found uh, according to our survey in Bangladesh, people before conducting our sales pilot in Bangladesh, and 90% of the people, they know the problem in their water. 70% people know uh, there are many product in Bangladesh like the Purit and other related product. But the, the main problem is that they cannot afford the appliance, like which is more than $30 uh, 
uh, because they can they cannot afford on this. And and more than seventy percent people say that they can afford our product uh, because this is very uh, affordable for them and as well as very accessible as long as we are running the business in the FMCG retail stores category. So as I said, basically, folio water, the world first water filter to be sold as a mass market grocery staples like soap, shampoo, snacks, and the SIM cards. And our product already created an intersection between the grocery staples, while people actually buying their necessity and commodity products, they are never at grocery outlets. So already our product is being sold from their grocery outlets, and which is all very affordable is the 24 cents, which is 20 taka or 20 rupees. And our product kills virus, bacteria, and pathogens, and give access to the safe drinking water. And this is very simple to use. They only need to buy one single filter paper from their grocery stores, never at grocery stores, and they can use it and their pictures, their uh, jugs and other related appliances. Everything is actually available in their rural households in Bangladesh. So there is no requirement any electricity and any other appliance like the big appliance they need to buy. So very simple to use our products. Folio water. So basically, we uh, source a sustainable uh, community metal pulp from the sustainable ground teeth, and we bring it to the sustainable mach uh, standard machineries and to make our finished goods. Our product is being tested many uh, third party laboratory tests, both in the US and Bangladesh. And according to the WHO guideline and the Bangladesh water testing protocol, our product is safe uh, for the drinking water parameters. So in Bangladesh, especially, uh, we uh, did, our, did our product test through the ICDDRB and BCSR. And they certified us this particular product meet the standard of the WHO guideline and Bangladesh water testing uh, procedure. As long as we are operating in Bangladesh, as uh, Bangladesh is a first market for the folia water, out of 170 million of the population, more than 50% of the population uh, is a socioeconomic class. So as I said, uh, based on the pyramid, uh, uh, customers is, is basically behind the uh, accessibility of the safe drinking water. So we are only targeting 14 million households apart from the 170 million, which is around 70 million of the population in Bangladesh. So in Asia, which is, uh, which is 200 million households and globally, which is 600 million households. So Polia Water is the first product from our parent company. We do R&D, we have the patents, and we do the standard manufacturing process. Our business model is to sell our product to the master distributor, like uh, we have a pipeline like the Unilever, uh, you know, the Unilever F1 and, and the Square, Beximco, and the ACI. All of the company is a $2 billion company in Bangladesh local company. So the revenue model is very simple. As long as you are operating, uh, paper is a very, very low cost. Our COG is four cents. Uh, our markup is two cents. We are selling our product to the master distributor at six cents. So they will make, they will import and make the finished goods and distribute to their uh, uh, port portfolio and bring it to the last mile distribution, and which is very much profitable for both the parties. So our progress so far is very much brilliant. We have reached out more than 15K household in Bangladesh and 70K, more than 70K customers. And our conversion rate is very much brilliant. So we have found 48% of our conversion, repeat conversion, any particular of the FMCG product who have found more than, more than five to 10% of the repeat conversion, this is a sustainable business. But what about the folio order? We found 48% of the repeat conversion in Bangladesh. We are now in 200, more than 300 uh, retail stores uh, who are selling our product directly to the customers. And we onboarded more than 40 as community sales agent, and we have 30, more than 40K direct beneficiaries in Bangladesh. So in a business scalability pathway, uh, we have a big financials. Over the 10 years, our expected gross revenue is 1,600 million. We'll be reaching out 3 million stores in the South Asia and we'll be selling 26,000 million unit pepper sales across the emerging markets. So 
Polio water is a grant funded so far. Now we are raising 2 million, 1 million in grant and 1 million in equity for Bangladesh sales operation for 2022 and 2023. The fund will be used for advertisement and promotion, sales and distribution and hiring the team. So our next series round is uh, uh, series B, which is South Asia application. So our GTM strategy is very methodical. As I said, we found proof of concept, which is demand and willingness to pay. 70% more than our target customer said, they can actually buy our product and which already we have found 48% of the repeat conversion. As, as far as our sales pilot in Bangladesh 2019 and 2022, support from the transformer in Unilever, that we have found 48% of the repeat conversion. Our second phase is conducting going on, which is operating in two districts, in Joshua and Khulna in Bangladesh. And we are now reaching out 650 stores, retail stores with the support from the Aqua for All. They have given us a grant, 300K USD, to conduct the retail sales pilot. The objective is to retail sales pilot to, to, retail, to identify the retail recipe and which is, which is basically, we'll find out the business scalability model as well. In next two years, we'll be reaching out 8,000 to 40,000 retail stores to attract the master distributor. As I mentioned, basically our business model is a B2B business model, like we'll be selling our product through, through the Unilever or other uh, sales pipeline they will be taking our product into their basket and take into their last mile distribution. And all of them actually have the more than 1 million of the retail stores across the Bangladesh. So this is a very scalable uh, opportunity for us. And we will be scaling in Bangladesh in 2020, 2024 across the country and will be replicated in the neighboring countries like India, Nepal, Vietnam, and the Indonesia as well. And to 2016 will be uh, scale up in the across the emerging countries, both uh, Asia and the Africa as well. So, as I said, uh, I'm Mohammed Rashid. I am over 20 years experience in most of them than the FMCG. I have been working for British American Tobacco, CP Bangladesh Company Limited, one of the largest social enterprise in the world, Bragg, and. Navana Group, which is one of the largest group of company in Bangladesh, uh, consisting 26 strategic business unit. And I, I was the head of marketing of the Navana Group. Prior to join in Folia, I was the head of the business of the Bragg Social Enterprises. So as a Folia is a material science company, the brilliant two founder, Dr. Jonathan Levin and Dr. Teresa, Teresa Denkubic founded the company. And they both are the material scientists. Today, basically, uh, apart from me, from the Bangladesh, I have also my two colleagues, Tanzir Hussain Gaffar. He is also a more than 10 years experience in the FMCG category, like the Coca-Cola, Pepsi, PNG, and the British American Tobacco. And one of our colleagues, Jiauddin, he is also working worked with me in the Bragg Social Enterprises. And he Thank also you. worked with the GSK, Glasgow Smithline, and the Square Group. So they are the senior team member. All of them basically came from the FMCG background as long as we are operating in the FMCG business model. So as I mentioned, our um, founders, uh, they bring huge uh, advisory and the investor board and who are the experts in the emerging market as well from the Coca-Cola, uh, uh, from the Hello Source, Clorox, and all of them know the emerging market as well. So we are, impact, we are impact oriented yeah. company. We directly address the SDG six, clean drinking water, and which is we are giving the access to 500 million population to access to clean drinking water, emerging countries. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Please help us to universal access to clean drinking water for low income population. Please reach out and also visit our virtual booth at Shanko. You can see all of detail about the folio water journey and our customer testimonial. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, such a great presentation. Uh, I have a number of questions uh, in the chat and some also which came directly, but uh, due to time, I would strictly limit the questions to just two for now. I'll forward the remaining question directly to you and I'll also just connect with the, the question 
whoever would have asked the question so that you can respond to them directly. So my first question, and kindly take a minute uh, in just responding. So my first question would be, what is the production capacity now? What, what about the production capacity for in Bangladesh? We have a, in Bangladesh, basically we don't do the manufacturing coating trial. Our coating trial and manufacturing process is happening in the USA. We are bringing the raw, uh, raw rolls from the United States and we have the capacity more than a million in a month uh, at this moment to uh, uh, the production capacity. Thank you. And what is the break even uh, quantity? The break even quantity, uh, basically, we have uh, just a second. Uh, As you look for that uh, response, you could also just uh, also touch on what is the life cycle of the product? So, how long does that product uh, one would use it before you'd want to replace it? Okay, one uh, one filter paper will give you the twenty liter of the filter paper, uh, twenty liter of safe drinking water, and and once it is actually used, it will be uh, become white, so that we have an IFU in instruction manual, so that people customer can know basically twenty liter is over and they can replace it's the filter paper. Now, in terms of the product itself, other than the water, how long does it take before it completely wear, wears out? How long, sorry, say again? How long does the product take before it uh, wears off that you would not use it anymore? Okay, so once it is a 20 liters done, we have a mini uh, IFU instruction. So it will, uh, it will, uh, it will, uh, it will be, uh, become white. Thank you. And uh, around so, the break- so, so, so something like that, uh, it will, uh, one liter will take 10 minutes to actually uh, for the drinking water. And around the break-even quantity, did you get the, do you have the- Yeah, yeah we have, yeah, yeah, we, we can respond this now for the break-even quantity. So which is something like then you know, in the 2025, uh, we'll be in a break-even point. In terms of quantity, uh, how many numbers do you need of the product to break even? So, so it's 1.8 million. And, 1. Currently, 8 million. Uh, and currently you're at what numbers? Uh, currently, basically, you are asking about the monthly basis or something in total? I'm asking about the quantity of the product. Well, in quantity, we, are, we have been sold so far 30,000 uh, 30, of the filter paper. So, so we are not focusing in the uh, scalability at this point in time. We are focusing very methodical process to identify the retail recipe and the marketing mix at this point. Thank you so much, Rashid. I, I guess I will just connect you with the, this the questionnaire so that uh, you could uh, respond. Oh, to may, may, may I give a quick answer? So we'll, we'll be at break even between about 50,000 and 250,000 households buying in a recurring fashion. In terms of operating costs, we'd be at break even at 50,000 households, but we're using the free cash flow to do the expansion. So, so about two to three districts we break even uh, because we have very good margins. And so this is a grocery business, so high volume. So we break even between 50,000 and 250,000 households, which is only about two to three districts. And really this means we get one national scale distributor and we're, we're very, very profitable from that onwards. And so we use the free cash flow to actually do the expansion across Bangladesh and then to find new national distributors in adjacent countries like Nepal, India, and Tunisia. Thank you, thank you so much for that response. Thank you so much, Rashid. Uh... Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, drop uh, our last enterprise for the day is Comet, uh, a software-based demand exploration toolkit for mini grid developers and community. The tool is designed to be used within a process that expose, explores mini grid planning and operational decisions. I would want to welcome Scott to take it away. Great, thank you, Alan. So I thank everyone for sticking around for the last presentation and to Sankalp for the opportunity to present to the group here. So what I'll do is I will share my screen and if there's any trouble seeing it, just let me know. Otherwise I'll assume it's up and we'll present. Okay, great. Good, so nice to chat with everyone. 
And I'll introduce myself and my co-founder. I'm based in, in Boston, my co-founder's in Malaysia. So it's a bit easier for me to talk right now. Uh, so Ayu Abdullah is, is the co-founder of mine. And, and both of us have been working for a number of years on Comet, which I'll describe in this presentation. So our sector of focus is on rural mini grids. So energy access for communities that are dense enough to support a small distribution network, but currently don't have access to uh, grid infrastructure. Within this space, it's recognized, it's clearly recognized now that it, we're not on track to reaching universal energy access, so Sustainable Development Goal 7. And we need some drastic changes to reduce costs of mini grid deployment. And it's also recognized that a key missing piece is on the demand side. How do we stimulate demand? How do we estimate demand? How do we manage demand? There, and there are currently very few tools, robust tools, data, and methods that allow us to do this demand estimation and management for mini grids. And so this is the, exactly the space where, where we are working. And we're focusing in particular on demand side solutions that have uh, that emphasize community engagement, where community engagement and building trust with the community is a key outcome and a key objective of how we approach the situation. The product that we've developed is a software, it's called Comet, the Community Energy Toolkit. And it's a simulation based software where a project developer or operator would work with communities in, in partnership to explore different design scenarios and then evaluate and estimate demand. So we do a few things with Comet. First there is, as I mentioned, there's a simulation platform, a multi-user simulation platform where, where the, <clears throat> the community members and, and, the, and the operators work together uh, and then receiving input from the group it's very important that we build community knowledge and understanding. This underlies a lot, it reduces a lot of project risk and also benefits in general, benefits the community by, by building up that capacity. And we're also able to much better estimate and manage the community driven demand through this process, through this tool. This has another, uh, has a number of impacts. It definitely reduces costs by having better sized systems Oversized systems tend to lead to poor returns and, and, and high project risks. Undersized systems tend to lead to communities' expectations being mismatched and potential conflicts or people um, uh, leaving the, leaving the, the, the mini-grid. Um, we also can increase revenue through demand stimulation through, through our approach. Um, and importantly, by building that local capacity and building local participation, we mitigate the project risk. So a little bit about what the, what the tool is, and then I'll talk about ourselves as, as a company. So it's deployed, it's, it's a software, as I said, we deploy through planning and management workshops in the field. We have, as you can see in this little graphic here, um, we have a workshop facilitator run the software on a device, set up a local Wi-Fi network, and then the participants in the workshop will log into this local network on other devices they may be notebooks or, or iPads, simple touch uh, enabled devices. And then this group will work through particular objectives of the software and able to explore, as I said, different design scenarios um, and what the management of that of those mini grid designs will look like. The, the software also produces very useful reports, data analysis, how people are paying, are they paying? This similarly for the, the community member side, they also get information on their energy use, how much they've paid, um, and that helps improve their understanding of what it will actually look like when the mini-grid comes. Importantly, the software can be deployed anywhere. It's, it can, you do not need power, you don't, do not need internet, it's, it's self-contained. Little picture here of uh, one of our session, early sessions in, in Malaysia where we've deployed, um, as I said, we can really set up anywhere and, and work through these very interactive, very engaging workshops. You find that people, if you look at our website, uh, there's, a, there's some videos of, of the workshops and people become really engaged and, and really get a much deeper understanding of the mini grid and then the different design options as they work through, uh, as they work through Comet and then through the different scenarios. When it, it's important to the use case for when is this used, and this also is important for our business model, there are really three different times when Comet is used. So first in the initial feasibility stage and project planning, 
when developers are typically looking to estimate what the demand will be, is it worth setting up a project? What is the willingness to pay uh, among the community? That's the first stage when it can be uh, utilized. Second, also by a developer, is once a design is finalized and once the, um, the management strategy is finalized, it's important to continue to refine and communicate this design with, with community members and end users. And this could be, for example, if there was a decision that we're gonna use uh, pay-as-you-go metering with energy limits at the household, exploring this and, and working through the community what this will look like and maybe refining some decisions on, on how those load management strategies will, will be implemented. We find this is really key for getting a much better understanding of willingness to pay and what the demand will look like and then getting the expectations of the community in line with what's going to be delivered. Those are the first two stages. So that's actually before a mini grid would be constructed. The final phase uh, or a third stage is actually after the mini grid is operating. There are many mini grids out there that are underperforming. Demand needs to be increased or they're running into system capacity limits. And the tool can be used to essentially look at design revisions. This could be increasing capacity. It could be changing tariffs, could be implementing demand management, stimulating demand, a number of different things that the software takes the community through very interactively and very in a very engaging way. And then you can look to improve the performance of the mini grid. So these are three different phases where, where we're currently looking to deploy the Comet tool. Our business model here, it's fairly simple, although there's a number of boxes on this chart. The, the main idea is that we have three customer segments. There are developers and operators who will use the tool directly within their projects. So they will run or they may contract or have a community engagement team, but they will be our customer to subscribe to Comet uh, for a, a license to Comet and, and they will run the field-based workshops. And another category are funders or portfolio managers. So this is actually our first segment that we're targeting. These are groups that are responsible for either funding or managing portfolios of projects. They typically have a very strong interest in ensuring that their capital investment is used efficiently. And so the use of Comet can be required by them or paid for by them. There's different models that we've, we've already explored um, by the developers themselves to reduce project risk and improve design. A third category are trainers and educators. The, the tool we found, get your hot and feedback, that it's very, very useful and, and very um, uh, highly effective way to train people on how mini grids operate and understanding the user behavior side and that impact on mini grid operations. So this is the third category. With all these categories, we provide the software. We have a pricing model where the users pay per project. This allows them to download the software and they activate a project. It also helps us differentiate the pricing based upon how many projects a particular user may have over a given time period. So we have a little bit more refined um, unit of value. So we can increase the price for those with a lot of projects or reduce the price for those with, with fewer projects. We also have the option as a revenue stream of hardware. The hardware is off the shelf. It's just the, um, the, the software can be downloaded on a laptop and you can have a router and a, a projector and, 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 and um, uh, tablets, um, but we also expect that some people would like a kit provided. And so we would um, do that curation of equipment for them have, um, and sell that to them with a small, with a, with a margin on our side. And then also training and consulting, particularly in the early stages of our company, I'll get to in a minute of where we are. This is a form of revenue where we get more directly involved in projects and we also spread the use of Comet and we work particularly with those uh, funders and portfolio managers on ensuring that their, their group of projects are implemented uh, effectively and efficiently. The size for Comet, so we've spent quite a bit of time trying to come up with very realistic market sizing estimates. The, the mini grid market itself, the, the larger figure here is the estimated investment needed to reach universal energy access of 128 billion by 2030, roughly over the next 10 years to reach this target. Within that amount, we've looked through different surveys of, from, from developers. They typically spend about 4.6% of their CapEx costs on community engagement and planning studies currently. So within that amount that we estimate that there's a portion that that developers are willing to spend on a software tool specifically. So this is actually 
our market estimate here is less than 1% of the amount that developers are currently spending on community engagement. We've looked regionally at where we feel uh, the, the tool is gonna be most effective and also come up with our own target of, of, of an obtainable market within four years of a $5 million um, recurring revenue uh, after four years of scaling up. Where we are right now, so we have a prototype that we've used and we've licensed to other uh, developers to use in the field. We have gotten very good feedback from, from, from the use of the tool. We have eight clients, 50,000 in revenue. These are clients that range from international NGOs, development assistance agencies, governments, developers, and universities. We are currently finishing up a version that has the license platform. Up till now, we, we haven't had the license platform for general release. Um, and so these are, uh, this is our, our plan for the finishing up in the co coming months. We've reached over 10,000 people in 13 communities and across five countries. We've started in Southeast Asia and more recently moved. We've had our first deployment in, in Africa, in Somaliland for three communities uh, in, in, uh, in that region uh, just a couple months ago. Our impact, so two things about Comet make it interesting. It's, it's an enabling technology. So we expect that through Comet, we make mini grid project deployment much more efficient and, and, uh, and um, expand and, and accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Through this, there are environmental benefits, social benefits. We have a target within four years to help enable 3000 mini grid projects, which would provide a 230 gigaton CO2 equivalent uh, avoided emissions. This would roughly equate to one and a half million households or more than 2 million people, um, improving quality of life, jobs, incomes. And in particular, Comet, due to its, the, the nature of the tool, we're very focused on community participation and agency. So we are enabling a direct shift towards more community involvement in the decision-making and management and, and potentially, uh, potentially management and operations of the mini grid. Through, through this, we have developed impact assessment criteria and look at how we can support the development of energy committees, increase gender representation within mini grid planning, and help build skills uh, and capabilities for local managers and operators of the mini grid. This is optional. The Comet is, can be deployed through different ownership structures for mini grids. We could use um, third party, community owned. It's, it's, it's not specified by the tool. Um, but definitely in all cases, we are increasing the community involvement, regardless of the, the, the ownership structure of, of the, the mini grid itself. Our advantages, we are the first mover. We're aware that you can't rely on being first mover for long, but we, we are the first mover, the first simulation based community engagement software that does demand estimation and mini grid scenario analysis. There are other competitors that do pieces of this that estimate demand, that take surveys and extrapolate those surveys, but there, there are none that have an operational software tool that incorporates this community engagement interaction along with the demand estimation and you know, the design support for, for mini grids. We have a very experienced team uh, that have deep knowledge and networks in the energy access industry, um, both with developers, with international organizations, um, we have uh, myself over 20 years experience working with renewable energy technologies and my co-founder over 10 years um, and, and I mentioned the other management team member who has a, a, a long history in product development. Also important is we have designed Comet for platform integration with other complementary tools in the mini grid design space. So this helps us lock in um, a, a user base that may be using other say complementary design tools. And we also collect very valuable experience through our deployments that can be used both for enhancing our tool and then this data and how a large set of, of community members would respond to different mini grid systems over time, over regions. This is a highly valuable data um, that, that we will maintain ownership of. Um, it's also not easy to replicate a, um, testing this product. Testing the product requires field deployments with communities that do not have electricity access. So that experience that we have had has, has really built in across you know, countries and regions has really built in a good competitive advantage. Our target is, this is our first raise of funding. We have 
um, so far funded our, our efforts through grants, through consulting rev project revenues, and through personal investments of the founders. Um, we are looking for our first raise of 600,000 for roughly 18 months of, of growth. This is primarily gonna be used for expanding our partnerships and our marketing and sales team and developing these contracts. As I said, with particularly with the, the, the clients that are the, the funders and, and the pro, and portfolio managers for Minigrids. So we will, in 2022, uh, we will release a new professional license that has the licensing platform in February. We're expanding our sales and marketing team. Um, we target to have 10 uh, network partners. These are, large, these are international networks um, that support knowledge exchange on uh, mini grid design and practices. So we will be working through those, those partners to, to distribute and promote Comet, work with institutional partners with portfolios of mini grids, uh, and then also uh, an initial target of, of subscribers in our, our first year uh, directly um, licensing to them of 100 um, with, with uh, rapid growth after that. The management team, myself, um, and looking after operations and, and, and also across the business, my colleague Ayu Abdullah has a background also in renewable energy and international development. And then uh, our product lead over 10 years experience uh, from a design UX UI software, software background. So really great group of people. We have, we have also support from um, other team members who worked with us on the, on the deployments across the communities that we've worked with in the past. Nice dis cross disciplinary group of people with engineering, with community development, with product design back backgrounds. That is the quick presentation uh, that I have right now. So looking forward to hearing any questions and try and answering them. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, that was a really detailed presentation. Uh, there's, there's one question that has come directly to me around uh, your marketing strategy in terms of you being in India, in Southeast Asia, and then also coming into Somaliland. So how do you navigate through those very uh, different geographies and how did you get to uh, tap into those markets. Sure. So our initial work was in Southeast Asia, and this is a an example of, of um, a network partner that we worked through is called HPNet, and so they're a hydro empowerment network is the name of it, and so they are a knowledge exchange platform for micro hydro developers, and through that platform we actually had access to developers and others that are that got interested in the tool, um, and so we we think the best way. While it's a fit, it's somewhat fragmented market when you look at different geographies, there are channels and platforms where people go to for, for information uh, to learn about mini grids and our, our strategies to expand um, to those, those, those channels. An example um, that we're reaching out to uh, um, is AMDA for, for in the African context, so the African Mini Grid Developers Association. Uh, and there are, there are other groups that, uh, that um, create good channels to, to reach those uh, um, those potential customers. On the same point, uh, how about regulation? Do you face any challenges? So just additional question around that. How are you mitigating challenges with regulation in different geographies? Yeah, so there's no direct in influence of regulation challenges on the use of Comet. So it's definitely something that a Miniger developer has to navigate. They have to understand any licensing and other requirements, kind of administrative and legal requirements to set up a project. But we have have you we don't believe that there are regulatory challenges that would restrict the use of, of Comet. Um, in, in fact, what it what it can do is by by getting a better understanding of community preferences um, and, and potential you know, local challenges. Um, that may arise during project operations, you can run through those scenarios and evaluate how your demand and your revenue will change and uh, um, help mitigate risk. So you could use, if, if there's a regulatory challenge of, for example, there was a requirement to change your, your pricing, um, your, your tariff structure, you could evaluate how that would affect your willingness to pay and, and your demand profile. So you would, in some sense, be able to mitigate that particular challenge through the use of Comet. But we don't see any you know, specific regulatory barrier to the, the use of, of, of our software. Thank you. And the last question I received is around uh, revenue share. So how, which one is the biggest revenue generator as at now? And just also going forward the next 
two or three years, where do you see uh, getting more revenue from the business lines? Sure, exactly. Yeah, so so we have a projection over the next four years, that, and we have our, our first year is definitely with the training and consulting. And the, and the reason is because we're going for high value contracts up front that will include a good training and consulting uh, portion. This also helps build evidence and awareness of Comet. As we move forward, the licensing revenue definitely takes over. The licensing revenue, the largest market of the licensing revenue, the largest market is actually the operators of grids because those are can be recurring um, expenses. Whereas a project developer would use the tool during the, the planning and, and construction phase. But from across our different revenue streams, it's initially training and consulting, um, which also have a higher contract um, uh, you know, finalization costs, you know, the bigger contracts, but then we move much more towards licensing where it's much lower, um, you know, onboarding costs uh, and, and that takes over the revenue. And the license just to profile that, is, is it a one-off licensing or there will be need for a, a annual subscription? Yeah, so our, the, the licensing model that we've developed is, has been made to, to differentiate pricing between big developers and big projects versus small developers and small projects. We want the, obviously the, the latter to pay less and then you know, the, the former to pay more because they will proportionally receive you know, more or less value. So what we've come up with is that a, a, a user downloads the software and actually has the software for free. They can set up projects. This, get, this gets them familiar with the software, but to activate the workshop simulations, they will pay per, per project. Um, and then this allows them to, as I said, pay less if they're only running one, one project. And then once that's activated, that will have a, a, a duration period um, and then it can be reactivated. So it's a, it's a time-based, but it's also um, denominated by a particular, by projects. I, I, I hope that was clear. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, unless I'll open up uh, if anyone in the session has any question, can unmute and uh, just ask the question. Seems like we don't have any question as now. Uh, we appreciate your time, Scott, and certainly feel free to anyone in the audience would want to connect with Scott. Please do reach out to Scott directly. You can so that you can get to understand the business better, and also connect with Scott on Brella, where you can also schedule. Uh, sort of like meeting session and, and also just engage and know much more about Comet. Thank you so much for your time, Scott. Yep. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank, thank you to everyone. Thank you. So uh, I, I would want to just, uh, that was the last uh, presentation for the day and I really appreciate for taking your time to participate and also just to here are all the pitches. So on closing, I want to thank you all the entrepreneurs who presented today and the investors for taking your time to ask all the valuable uh, uh, questions. Please don't hesitate to follow up for any connection or, or partnership with these enterprises directly or we can connect you with them. I would also want to encourage all the investors at Sankal to explore our digital directory of entrepreneurs the digital directorate has investment collateral for a number of entrepreneurs. You probably already received an email about it, but if not, please reach out to me and I'll get you access to get to the digital directory uh, where you can access this uh, number of the enterprises that have pitched and even some others. I remember there's one uh, investor in the, in the session who requested for the deck. So, you could be able to uh, have all the decks through the digital directory. Uh, either way, we can also share with you directly. We have one more slumber party tomorrow evening and we hope you'll join us tomorrow too. Have a great rest of the day. Good night from Nairobi.